Well, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think everybody's kind of coming grips that, um, you know, right now they're not necessarily looking for a point guard. They're not necessarily looking for a shooting guard. And I think McCord Williams may not have that player, may not have had that potential. Uh, get, you know, potentially really good value for him now. While you can, like you said, get him while, while his value is at the highest. And, right. and I'm not sure whether his highest is now or whether maybe it was higher, you know, a little bit higher back last draft time uh, when he was coming off that rookie of the year. But certainly it was still high. Uh, and it's another couple of years where he doesn't improve that jump shot or he doesn't improve his turnovers or, or what have you uh, might not have been as high. So I think I think this was kind of an opportunity. What did you learn today from listening to Sam Hankey that maybe you were questioning what were some of the highlights for him because, you know, 45 minutes, he doesn't talk all that much, but when he goes, he seems like he gives you stuff. What were some of the what was some of the key information that you took from him today? Yeah, well, I, th- I think Sam is really desirous not to talk bad about his former players. Um, I think, you know, he doesn't, he's not going to tell you why Michael Carter Williams wasn't going to become that superstar. He's not going to say, uh, you know, we, we needed Michael to improve this, this, and this. He didn't do it, so we want to move him for a, a pick that we think can. Um, but I think the other underlying subtext was just that, that he's not necessarily in the team building phase as much as he is in the building block obtaining phase um, you know he's not worried about the windows or the doors or or, or, or the interior dressing he needs to get the frame built uh, and he's looking for those individual pieces that can be great so he can then build a great team around them uh, the other thing I think I really took away was was about the two players that they got back um, you know he seemed really high on Isaiah Kane and uh, seemed like he really wanted him in the 2013 draft and it seems to me like he's a piece that could become not necessarily a starting point guard, or, although he'll start over the next, you know, 29 or whatever games they have left. Um, but he looks like he could be a potentially backup point guard. I don't think he was a throw in the deal. I don't think it was just to get the Denver pick. But I think they do like Isaiah Kanan as well. And a guy like that that can shoot and can shoot off the dribble, I think, could be an interesting piece for the team. Uh, the other thing is it didn't seem like he really, it doesn't seem like JaVale McGee is necessarily in the plans. Uh, he talked repeatedly about, you know, using that cap space to help a team get out of a contract. And, and he, you know, he really referred to McGee more as a contract. Uh, and again, I, I think it wouldn't surprise me at all if McGee never really played for the Sixers. Now, he might, because maybe he thinks that if he gives McGee, you know, 25 or 30 minutes, something he's really never gotten in his career, he can pump up his stats a little bit, maybe generate some interest from around the league. But I'm not sure I'd really look at McGee as a, a long-term piece for the team. All right. It's been suggested by the people who don't like this deal that the timeline has been shifted. Do you think that that is necessarily accurate? No. Um if you retain, if you if you come to the conclusion that Mike Carter Williams isn't going to improve that jump shot, isn't going to re, you know become a a let's say a top ten point guard in the league, and he doesn't fit with Joel Embiid, I don't see how keeping him, you know, pushes the rebuild further. I don't, I don't see how that helps you move further along in the rebuild. Uh, if you avoid this opportunity, if you decline this opportunity to get talent while you can and keep him just because you know, that pushes the rebuild forward, even if he doesn't fit, even if you don't have confidence in him being great. Uh, you know, I think if you have to look at it, Michael Carter Williams was the 11th pick in a, in a, a week draft. Um, he was the perfect pick because if he improved his shooting, he could become much better than the pick they invested in him. But that doesn't mean he was necessarily guaranteed to improve that shooting or even that it was a great chance, just that it was worth the risk. Uh, so I think, you know, holding on to him just because he was the first player that Sam Hinkie brought in, I think that's, that's, you know, I think that's a little um, not the way to go about it. Derek, what uh, do you say, it, Derek, what do you say then, because I agree with you, um, the people who are suggesting, well, Henke picked Michael Carter-Williams, so therefore that's a reflection on him making that pick. I disagree with that totally, but what do you say? You know, does this suggest that Henke's a bad drafter because he, in fact, drafted MCW and then, quote-unquote, gave up on him? Well, I think two things. First, you have to look at how many players were were available after that pick. Uh, really, the only one that you're you're kind of kicking yourself for is, is Giannis, um, and he's you know he was a guy who was relatively unknown. He was not a guy who was in the top ten really on anybody's draft boards. So if you're telling me that that 
you have the 11 pick and there's only one player selected after there that, that that's maybe a better prospect i don't really see how you can say that sam hankey can't draft because of that uh the other thing i would i would say is that i think the sixers world kind of got turned around a little bit when they were put in a position where they can draft a franchise level big man a big man that you can really run your offense through i think the needs that they had out of the point guard i think changed a little bit when that happened they need somebody who can you know spread the floor who can work off the pick and roll and michael's more of a a rebound the ball on the defensive end push the ball in transition and get people looks in that way i'm not sure that you know the the value of michael carter williams is going to be as high when they're building around joel Embiid as it might have been when they were building a different team Derek bodger's with us at Derek bodner nba on twitter Derek. He did say, after talking about Michael Carter-Williams, virtually in the next sentence was how important outside shooting, specifically the three, was. He did really, you know, say, hey, two, three's more than two, and that does, you know, that is a big something that they want to look at. So, I know he said, look, we're not looking for a point guard or this. We're looking for as many all-stars, and we are looking for players who can get us into May and in June but if they ended up with one of those point guards in this draft, plus that Laker pick, whether it be this year or last year, isn't that, in fact, a win for this team? I mean, essentially, they've replaced Carter Williams and still got that Laker asset. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think both uh, Moutier and, and D'Angelo Russell are better prospects than Michael Carter, Carter Williams. Um, you know, Moutier, I think, has a lot of, of the same similarities, especially in the jump shot that's questionable. Um, but I think he's a more natural scorer in the half court, more natural really creating offense for others because he's able to get in the, the lane with, with such ease. Um, and Russell, he would just be a, a really good fit with uh, uh, Joel Embiid. He can shoot off the pick and roll. He can shoot off the dribble. A really creative passer. And I think the combination of that passing and that, that shooting from the perimeter uh, I think would be a really interesting combination. Yeah, I do think both of those players are, are better uh, prospects long-term than Michael Carter-Williams. And you're right. If you if you leave with let's say Embiid and Noel and Russell, and you still have you know really what are likely two top seven or two top ten picks in next year's in the 2016 draft, along with all that cap space, I mean it's not just drafting four guys in a lot in top ten over a three year period, but you can combine those picks if you want to make like a James Harden style trade, and you're also going to have that cap room. To, to to then pursue somebody in free agency. So I think they're in a pretty good spot right now, even after this trade. Yeah, and, you know, one of the interesting things is 2016, does that still to you, or I don't know if it ever did to you, but seem like that is when this thing will start funneling? He did mention Saric. That's when the building in Camden will be finished. That's when there's a very high-quality free agent class. It seems like that would be some sort – I know Hanky doesn't want to back himself into a corner – but would 16 sound like an accurate time frame? Yeah, uh, well, because you're going to have, you know, I think this coming year it's really going to be about developing Joel Embiid and whoever their 2015 draft pick is. Uh, and I think I think that's going to be exciting, to be honest, because I think Joel Embiid is that good of a player, that captivating of a player. Uh, that, that's going to be, that's really going to hold at least the diehard Sixers fans' interest. Um, but you're right, I mean, with the cap increasing, and it's going to increase by uh, upwards of, of $25 million, uh, in the summer of 2016, uh, along with maybe some of these Sixers players, these picks starting to assert themselves, and, and having two upcoming draft picks in the 2016 draft, um, I do think that is the time when you can really see Sam Hankey become aggressive, start to find the complementary piece that he's going to need to surround Joel Embiid, and using that cap space along with those, those future picks that he has to really start acquiring not just you know, assets and potential picks, but guys who are current NBA players who can really surround them and, and enhance their game. Derek, what questions might you still have even after hearing Hanky talk for 45 minutes? I mean, was there something that maybe still has you scratching your head, or do you think that he did a really good job and a good job of explaining everything? Well, I mean, he, he explained things kind of how we expected him to explain things. Uh, he's not going to, like I said, he's, he's not going to disparage former players. Um, it would be really interesting to get his opinion on Michael's progress over the last, you know, 20 months or whatever that they had him, uh, see what they expected him to improve, um, what he didn't improve, specifically the shooting, and how that really carries over to when they're evaluating guys on top of the draft. You know, it's one thing to, to say, we, you know, shooting is a teachable skill, 
it's easy to say that at the 11th pick where every player taken at that stage is flawed. Um, you know, if Michael Carter-Williams had a jump shot that people were confident in, he would have been a top five pick. So it's easy to gamble on him because the, the, you know, the game, the benefit so far outweighs the reward that even if it's not likely that Michael Carter-Williams approves his jump shot, it's worth it because that game is so high. It'll be interesting how he values shooting when he's drafting in the top three or the top five. Picks that really, you know, define a franchise is shooting something that you can rely on or is shooting something that you can hope improves. Uh, and it'll be interesting how he tackles that because, like we said, we have a guy like Moutier, all the athletic talent in the world, but right now really struggles with his shot. And you have kind of the polar opposite of that in D'Angelo Russell, a guy who doesn't really have top-end athleticism, but is, is really a shooter that you have to account for at all times when he's on the court. So it'll be, it'll be – I'd really love – not so much to get his thoughts on, on Michael Carter-Williams as much as to try to predict what he's going to be able to do in the future when he has these extremely important assets in this draft coming up. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things about Michael Carter-Williams is, you know, the, the three-point shooting was, what, 25%, which was actually a drop from last year to this year. And you wonder, you know, ultimately in the end, now he said this was a deal we just couldn't refuse because that level of pick doesn't move. But was this the threshold? Was there... You know, was this the only level of deal that was going to get done, or was that shooting percentage going to be too much for him to hold on to? Yeah, I mean, it, it's you know, it's it's tough because Michael did have that shoulder operation in in the summer and didn't get the work that he really needed. But I mean, this isn't a new trend. He was twenty nine percent in college. He was twenty six percent last year during his rookie year. So I think I think the combination that it wasn't really trending in the right direction. Uh, kind of made him, at least it made me question whether or not it was ever going to trend in the right direction, at least at a significant enough level to where he could overcome that. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be really interesting to see what he does with shooting going forward. You know, obviously he's had some great successes. Uh, Jeremy Grant, we've talked about, he didn't hit anything at Syracuse last year, and all of a sudden he's shooting like 38% from three this year on, on small sample size, but he's looking good doing it. So It'll be interesting to see how he, he really evaluates his confidence in improving somebody's shooting going forward and whether or not this kind of changes the way that they look at that, that equation. Yeah, and, you know, and, and he said, look, Michael Carter-Williams didn't do anything wrong here. This was just something that was too good to pass up. When you watched Michael Carter-Williams, do you look at a guy they gave up on too soon? Uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I think we have a pretty decent idea of what Michael Carter-Williams will be. Um, obviously, he, he could be, become a better version of that. I think the defense is one side where he, he improved pretty significantly this year. Um, but I, I think that if he doesn't improve that jump shot and he doesn't cut back his turnovers, I have a little more confidence in cutting back the turnovers than I do the jump shot. But if he doesn't improve that jump shot, I, I really see it as a difficult proposition to make him a key point of a, a, an efficient offense. Uh, and right now I don't have the confidence, so I can't say that I, I think they gave up on him too soon. Yeah, and, you know, look, the, the, the four draft picks, I know it sounds like, you know, hey, they're not going to get all four of these picks. That Heat one seems pretty good, correct? Yep. Yeah, no, I mean, not, it, it'll be interesting with them because they, they obviously just got Goran Dragic yesterday. Uh, but there's also the news of, of the blood clots uh, with Chris Bosh. So it'll be really interesting how that impacts the rest of their season. But I, I still think they're going to hold on to a playoff spot in the East. Well, either way you slice it, Derek, it seems that they're either going to have three picks this year and two next year or two this year and three next year, right? Correct. Uh, they have they have you know potentially four this year uh, and then then their own next year. That's so, right. There's there's five between the two next two years. And I don't see either you know any of of the Heat pick, the Lakers pick or the Oklahoma City pick extending beyond next year. Right. So ultimately, over the next two years, they add that extra pick with the Lakers pick, and they like the position they're in this year to possibly replace him. Or there could be a scenario such as this, Derek, where you get a guy like an Okafor and end up using one of those picks with Noel to get yourself back into a position to replace Michael Carter-Williams. So it seems like it's given him a lot of flexibility as well for a guy that you believe – Maybe I don't want to say peaked, but that shooting was going to be a problem. And I think ultimately you're right. I think Sam Hankey said, look, I just don't think that this guy is going to develop to the player that we need him to be. Yep, and ultimately these guys, if you hold on to them too long, you can really lose an opportunity. Like you were bringing up some examples before I came on. Um, people in this town are killing 
uh, the Phillies for not trading Dominic Brown when he still had value. So it, it, it's kind of a tightrope that he has to walk. A lot of times what happens in the present, people don't agree with. Um, but I think when you look back on, on in, in, in the future, when you look back on it, it, it could really have a, a different narrative uh, than it currently does. Well, and, and I mean, does this move to you a similar situation to Drew Holiday where it's like, hey, give us Drew Holiday and we'll give you the number six pick, which ends up being Nerland's Noel. I mean, is it a similar scenario where it was just too good to pass up? You're going to give me a top ten pick for Drew Holiday? Drew's good. But he's not that good. Same situation, or you know, not really. No, I think it. I think it certainly is. I think a lot of times these these awards, um, you know, drew with the All Star nomination, and really he got that All Star nomination largely because a lot of the point guards in the East were injured that year, and, and Michael Carter Williams winning R- Rookie of the Year in what was one of the worst rookie classes in, in recent memory. Um, a lot of times these these awards kind of pump up somebody's value and at least pump up the public perception of their value. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think it's a similar situation. I think it's a little more surprising with Michael, just because, you know, Sam drafted him; he didn't inherit him. Uh, so you assume that there was a little more confidence there. But yeah, it's, it's certainly a very similar situation. All right, Derek Bodner at Derek Bodner NBA Liberty Ballers. Those guys have a ton more on this trade, and of course, you can read more of Derek's stuff at 973ESPN.com. They do have a game tonight. Who's playing point guard? <laughs> uh, they did sign Tim Frazier a contract. Uh, Aya Kanan is not going to be available tonight, so it's likely going to be Tim Frazier and Jakar Sampson. All right, there'll be meet the players night at uh, the Wells Fargo Center tonight in Philadelphia. The Sixers take on the Pacers, and, of course, at Derek Bodner, NBA, for more on the game tonight. All right, Derek, thanks, man. Yep, take care.